think it's right? I can't remember uploading that. Um, it would be um, one, two, three, four, fifth slide, you'll know by the fifth slide. Um, maybe by the fourth slide, you'll know. So, um, But anyway, I'm glad that you're here today. Thank you for coming out. And for those who have tuned in to watch us um, on our live stream, we, we appreciate that. Uh, thought as well. Thank you for being here. And we have been talking about cultural Christianity. And uh, today I want to talk about um, becoming what we pray. And I want to thought uh, a thought process today is to think about prayer and um, and what prayer can do. And, and of course, I want to give you a quick review because we haven't done this for two weeks. But what is cultural Christianity? And here are some things that we would consider for just a few examples that are set forth. That cultural Christianity is a religion that superficially identifies itself as Christianity, but does not adhere to the faith. A cultural Christian is a nominal believer. He wears the label, or she wears the label as a Christian, but the label has more to do with family background or upbringing than any personal conviction that Jesus is Lord. Cultural Christianity is more than just uh, spiritual. A cultural Christian identifies with certain aspects of Christianity such as good works of Jesus, but rejects the spiritual aspects required to be biblically defined as a Christian. And so we need to determine if our relationship with Jesus is a relationship that is built on biblical principles or principles that we have set on our own. And it does not take long to discover that cultural, Christ, Christ, cultural Christianity is based on what we think, what we feel, and what we desire out of life rather than seeking the one that we say we placed our hope and trust in for eternal life. Amazingly, we can trust Jesus, the source of our salvation for eternal life, but it seems like most people can't trust Jesus for their temporal life. Two Sundays ago, we started with the series, Becoming What We Worship. Jesus, Jesus noticed that the Pharisees did worship. There was no doubt about that. Jesus said that they worshiped God with their mouth and their lips. And if you were to pass by one of those men, you might have thought that you had just met the most religious man in your entire life. And you were right. He would be religious. Jesus noted that though, though they were worshipers with their mouth and lips, he said that their heart was far from God. Worship became their idol. I want to ask you this morning the question. Remember, I had, I had built this message a couple of weeks ago and and, 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 and so these questions are kind of silly now uh, to some degree, but my question was, is why did you come this morning? Some of you came to defy the COVID-19, I know, but, but that was not of my intent two weeks ago or when I was putting this together. But the question was, did you come to worship? You know, is, is that why you come? Did you come to worship? Did you come to be transformed, to go out this morning different than when you came in? Or did you come to sit in a chair to feel good about yourself? Did, did we come to be seen? What was our motive to come to worship? And so this morning, uh, as we turn our attention to prayer, I, I want to ask, what is our motive of prayer? You see, the Pharisees believed in prayer as well. And if you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to begin in verse 5. And just as Jesus said before, Jesus said that the Pharisees worshipped. And today we're going to see what Jesus said to the, about the Pharisees when it came to their prayer life. In Matthew chapter 6, in verse 5, if you would stand with me this morning as we begin verses 5 through 8a is where I'm going today. He says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when we pray, use not vain reputations as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard uh, for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Those are the words of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the adhering to your word this morning as we open it up and we talk about becoming what we pray. And Lord, I, I would ask that as we 
gather together to think about these scriptures this morning, that we would reflect on the thought of what is my prayer life really like? And Lord, why, why is it important that I pray? So Lord, as we venture through your stories this morning, as we venture through your words this morning, I pray that you would speak to our hearts on becoming what we pray. We thank you for the time that you've given us here to come to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to just have two areas to look at. The first one this morning is the practice of prayer. And let's be clear this morning about what we're reading. The Bible said that the Pharisees prayed. They, they became men that practiced prayer like no other. Again, if you would have heard one of these men pray, you would have thought that this man must have known God because of the way that he prayed. And this may be startling to some here this morning, so you may want to reach out and grab your neighbor if they're not too far from you today. If not, you might want to grab the back of your chair about what I'm about ready to say, okay? A person who prays and prays often and great is not a sign that a person really knows God. Case in point, the Pharisees. Notice the first words in verse 5. And when thou prayest. You see, the expectation of God is that people would pray. Jesus knew the expectation was to pray to the Father. The expectation is there. Prayer is to be expected. Jesus also says not to pray like the hypocrites, a play actor. For Jesus to use the word hypocrite in this context means that Jesus seen something that is wrong with their prayer. Jesus knows that these men love to pray. We noted that before. They love to pray. Their position was to stand and pray. Is that wrong? Are the hypocrites wrong for standing to pray? Not according to Mark chapter 11, verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive that you ought against any, for your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you in your trespasses. So standing is not the problem. Notice that the Pharisees are praying in the streets. It has been said that the Pharisees would walk a little bit, stop, and pray aloud. It was almost like a, a ritual for them. They would walk through the streets and take so many steps, and they would stop, and they would pray. And they'd take a few more steps down the street, and they would stop, and they would pray. It was a continual cycle as they were in the streets to be praying. But here is the key word that you need to write down to ponder. The Pharisees' prayer life was motivated by the overwhelming desire, as Jesus says, to be seen by men. We are not going to draw the conclusion that every Pharisee who prayed was a hypocrite, but a very large part of the Pharisaical office was filled with men that wanted ambition of their peers. Their prayers they desired would be uh, answered. Their motive was to pray to be seen of men. And they were seen by men. However, don't forget that they were also seen by God. Jesus is not done on showing the Pharisees how they practiced their prayer life. He said in verse 7, he said with a description of praying in vain reputations. It was to use the phrase words over and over. To repeat in such a way it was saying that we must repeat our prayer because God is not hearing us. Therefore, I'm going to continue to pray these words over and over because eventually God will hear me. To give your thought to the phrase vain reputation would mean babble or to stutter uh, at a senseless reputation. Jesus said that this is the, what the heathen do, meaning the Gentiles. It was repeating words without meaning. They were empty. Remember when Elijah was on Mount Carmel and uh, he, was, he was giving this competition of calling down fire from heaven? And do you remember that bringing down the fire to the altar that we can remember that it was these that were uh, uh, going out and, 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 and the false prophets? And, and the Bible says that this is what they were doing in 1 Kings 18, 26. 
It said that when they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it, they called the name of Bell from morning even until noon, saying, Oh, Bell, hear us. It was a com- complete over and over, Oh, Bell, hear us. Oh, Bell, hear us. Oh, Bell, hear us. Oh, Bell, hear us. If there was a Bell God, he would probably hurt him the first time. But you know what? Elijah didn't say, Oh, God, hear me from noon till from morning till noon, did he? And so God is saying, listen, these men that are praying, he's talking about this. Jesus went on to point out that these, these men who were praying, the way they were praying, were not the, they were practicing prayer, and that's all they were doing. Just stopping and praying, stopping and praying, using the same words over and over. And he goes on, he talks about their devotion of having long prayers with many words. I mean, they they would come in and they would just pray for a very long time using many words. You see, everything they were doing in prayer was hinged on external actions. It was like, let me pray. Let me pray loud. Let me pray over and over. Let me pray for a few hours. And you know what? If I can do that and I can impress you, you're going to think that uh, I'm a great prayer warrior. And that was the attitude of these men. Let me pray loud. Let me play long. Let me let everybody see what I'm doing. Because if I do all of this, I'm going to be the guy that can reach God through my prayers. A practice of prayer. And the Lord gave them the result. In verse 5, he said, they shall have the reward. To gain their point, what they had seek for, He said, I'm going to give it to them. I'm going to give them the praise of men. Because that's what their practice of prayer all hinges on, is outside actions for the praise of men. And if that's what their reward is, if that's what they want, I can give that to them. We know that the piece of Scripture, as James 4, 6 says, he giveth more grace where he said God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Y'all want to act that way? Y'all want to pray that way? You want to practice prayer that way? Go right ahead, but it's not going to get you much. But if you're looking for the praise of men, that's exactly what you're going to get. That's all you're going to get. Because the prayer life that you have, it's just a form. It's just a form. But then there's the power of prayer. And we should all be on the same page this morning on this thought that Jesus expects us to pray. Because that's what Jesus says. He says, when thou prayest. He expects the expectation of prayer to be in everyone's life. And prayer is such a vital part of our relationship with the Lord. You see, we have the opportunity with our mouth or by thought to speak to our Heavenly Father. And if we truly believe that God sent His Son for us, that Jesus died for our sins, and then then we have this opportunity to live the will of God, if we believe those three things, then we must be people of prayer. Jesus said that when we pray, He says, I want you to go to your closet. Now, I know that sounds different, I know that sounds weird, but I I want you to see what Jesus was getting at. He said, when you decide in your daily moment or moments to get along with your Heavenly Father, I want you to go to a place, a place where you're going to draw your attention upon Him and Him alone. He says, "I, I want you to get alone. And not only do I want you to get alone, but I want you to get someplace where you could shut the door. Notice what this will do. First of all, it puts a person in direct opposition of the, uh, of the Pharisee, of not being seen. Jesus is wanting us to see that prayer is not being about being seen. It's about getting alone and shutting your door. It, it's isolating yourself where you and the Father are speaking to one another. 
Secondly, it puts a person in direct opposition to the Pharisees of possibly being, being undisturbed, being in public. And thirdly, it puts a direct opposition to the Pharisees of being heard by many. You see, we are people who like to pray on the fly, as we say. But most of us may not have a great quiet time of prayer with the Father. The secret time we develop is a time of heart-to-heart and sharing with the Father. It's moments where we can get to the Father and share the praise of who He is and to share our heart before Him and where we are in our life. You see, the secret time in the closet doesn't go unnoticed. Just as Jesus said, the Pharisees had the reward. Jesus says, this is the one who prays in secret. He said, this is what I'll do. I'll openly award him. From the pulpit commentary, there's a quote I'd like to share with this, uh, with you this morning about this verse. He says, prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of hidden fire that trembles in the breast, Prayer is a burden of sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye when none but God is near. What is the greatest reward for praying privately? Answered prayer. Think about what you are praying for and what answer are you expecting. John Bunyan tells of how beggars used to carry with them a bowl. And they would carry this bowl and they would went to a house, they would begin to beg. And some of them brought only small bowls. And so however rich and bountiful the householder might be, he could give not them more than their bowl could contain. Others brought great bowls, bigger bowls, and carried them home. Maybe from our standpoint, the very little time we spend in prayer is just a small bowl. It's just a small bowl that we spend very little time speaking to our Heavenly Father that we're just bringing a small bowl and He cannot fill it more than what it is. Perhaps we need to think about bringing bigger bowls to our Lord to fill. I want to give you an application, and I want these words that Jesus spoke by a particular parable that he told in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And I want you to notice the, between the power of prayer of the sinner and the practice of a Pharisee. And I want to start with the practice of prayer again on this, because Luke chapter 18, 9 says that he spake a parable unto them, a certain which trusted themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Remember, this is a parable that sets up spiritual truths. He said in verse 10, he said, There were two men who went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So I want you to notice that first of all, here we go, we see public worship, just as we're in today. They were going to the temple, and while they went to the temple, they went for a purpose. And that purpose, the Bible says, is they went to worship, they went to pray. So you understand that not only did they go to public worship, they went there to pray which prayer is an act of worship. And as we are gathered here this morning, if we come with the right attitude of worship, then our hearts ought to be open to prayer. In verses 11 and 12, the Pharisee stood and he prayed uh, thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as the other men, as extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Can, can you really see what's happening here? Two men went to the temple to worship. The purpose of the worship was to pray. The Pharisee, get this, lost his purpose to pray. You say, well, that can't be true. It is. Pharisees love to pray, you said. They do. But you're, if you read this, Jesus is telling us that the purpose of prayer was completely missed. This Pharisee, according to the parable, was praying in God's house and giving himself all the glory. He missed the purpose of prayer. It wasn't about him. Prayer is all about him, not us. He was missing it. 
He was comparing himself to the guy next to him. We read that in verse 13 that the publican standing afar off would not even lift up so much of his eyes as to heaven, but smote his breast saying, God, be merciful to me as a sinner. You see, the publican displays the power of prayer. Note first that he stood far away, feeling so unworthy to be in the presence of the Lord. Besides that, he would have most likely had to stand in the outer courts. Second, that being such a sinner, he could not even lift his eyes to look because of the shame and the guilt that was in his life. And thirdly, he smote his breast and smote his breast in grief and despair because of his sin. The publican was not thanking God for his sinful life, but was asking God to be merciful to such a sinner. In comparison of the scripture that we've looked at this morning, we need to come away with a thought that I believe can help us. Jesus understood that many could pray, and that many people could pray in public, and they could use the finest words, and for the longest of time, but I think Jesus is pointing something to us that's even far more defining. Jesus is not so much concerned that we do pray, but he's more concerned on how we do pray. What is our motive of prayer? Jesus is pointing to the fact that the one who spends time in personal prayer, closing out everything around us, getting along with God, is far more important than to be able to pray in public and to be seen by men and to be noticed by men. Let me expand on that thought. And I could be completely wrong. But I don't think you can truly enjoy worship with prayer in public until you can enjoy personal prayer in private. You see, I will never be able to enjoy the public realm of faith to feel the purpose of public prayer, regardless of who is praying, until I learn to pray in private first. You see, I believe there's a lot of folks, cultural Christians, who can pray in public. I believe they can walk into a church and you can call on them. They can pray. I, I believe they can pray in a restaurant. I, I, I believe they can pray, uh, pray, you know, on the fly, on the flyball moments. But I guarantee you most of them do not have a devoted time of prayer where they shut themselves out and get along with God. Why is that? Because too many people say, well, I tell you what, Pastor, I just don't have a real big private life, prayer, prayer life. I just don't have the time. I just don't have time to get up and, and to, to take a few moments and just close the world out around me and get along with my Father and pray. I just don't have the time. Well, I want you to know, Pastor, I really just don't have that personal prayer life where I, I come and I just get along with God and speak to Him on a daily basis because really that's just not my thing. It's just not my thing. I, I just, I'm just not good at that. And we could offer excuses after excuses after excuses. But this I do know. The person I think that has the best public prayer life is the person that spends a lot of time in their private time speaking to the Father. There's a lot of people who get fidgety, anxiety moves in, when they come to church and somebody stands and called on and they begin to pray. And when that person stands to pray and they're, they're talking to God on behalf of everybody here, there are people who sit around him, that person or that there are people in the congregation who start to get fidgety, anxiety sets in, 
they can't stand it. They, they think you're praying too long. They think that they're saying too much. And you know why they feel that way? It's because that person who's praying, who's probably have a powerful prayer, they're embarrassed because that person who's praying so powerfully has a private life of prayer, and this person over here has nothing. And what happens is when we don't have a private life of prayer, we can't stand people who has a public life of prayer because we know they're reaching God and we're not. And I see that everywhere I can go, in churches everywhere I've been. The jealousy of public prayer by those who have a great private life of prayer. So what are we becoming in our prayer life? What are you becoming? cultural Christian who just do flyby flies of prayer who just kind of just you know praise here and there who practice prayer when we need to or do we have a real powerful prayer life where we spend time with God and seek him out one of the things that I wanted to do this year is I wanted to really boast my prayer life, and so at the beginning of the year, um, that was one of the things that was on my agenda to try to develop uh, this year with a more powerful prayer life um, of, of, of my own accord. And so far, thank the Lord, it's uh, March the 15th, so for the first two and a half months, I've been able to, to be able to every day um, to spend time in prayer. As a matter of fact, in, in part of my journaling, I have a a half a page of, 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 of things that I write down that I, I want to pray for, praying for someone, praying for some circumstance, for, praying for some healing, and, and, and writing those down and praying for them specifically. And then I get to go back at the end of the month and flip back through and begin to write down how those prayers have been answered, what God has done since then, and, and really begin to see God to move. And really begin to see how God is using prayer as a vehicle to, to push me more into more of a private relationship with Christ. And speaking to Him. And asking. And listening. I want to become a more powerful praying person. Not just a person who practices prayer. What about you? What about you? What kind of prayer life do you want? What kind of prayer life do you desire? And whatever it is, begin to ask the Lord to help you find that steps, to find the direction that you can spend, whatever amount of time that is, you can spend every day closed off in the audience of one speaking to the Heavenly Father. Because when your private prayer is in the right spot, spot and perfected with Him, man, it's public prayer. It's not a motive to be seen by men, but it's a motive to see God move among men. Up our life. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come today and to speak and, and to open up your scriptures on cultural Christianity and the becoming what we pray. God, help us to see how important prayer life really is, our prayer life. Lord, help us to see how that can really transform our life. That we set aside time every day close out everything around us to come and speak to you, to come and listen to you, to come and hear the, uh, to come and give praises to who you are, and then to speak about ourselves. God, let us, let us be challenged 
not to be like the Pharisees who were hypocritical in their prayer life. But God, to be that person, to be that one whose prayer life is so powerful. So God, I'm asking, I'm asking publicly for me my life, my prayer life will grow stronger before you. God, I pray that you would just help us as we sing this verse of invitation. As we ask ourselves, what kind of prayer life do I want? Do I want to practice prayer or do I want the power of prayer? In Jesus' name we pray.